the Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. <laughs> The makers of Johnson's Wax Products for home and industry present Fibber McGee and Molly with Bill Thompson, B. Benaderet, Arthur Q. Bryan, and they call me Harlow Wilcox. The script is by Don Quinn and Phil Leslie, and the music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. You know, I get a real kick out of seeing someone use a wax polish for the first time. Because the minute they wax a chair or table and see that wonderfully rich, gleaming, wax-polished luster, they simply can't wait to wax polish all the rest of their home. I think you'll be that way, too. And here's why. For one thing, your floors, when wax-protected, have a rich, mellow beauty that sets off your furnishings to full advantage. Then Johnson's Wax brings out the beautiful, natural grain of things like tabletops and gives them a truly gorgeous, sunshiny luster. Furniture glows and sparkles handsomely. Leather articles and picture frames have that rich, tasteful, well-preserved look. In fact, when wax polished with Johnson's Wax, your whole house shines and sparkles as it never sparkled before. Protected against dirt, wear, and spill things. I hope you'll try it. You'll be really pleased if you do. Genuine Johnson's Wax, liquid paste or cream. Valentine's Day has come and gone. Lincoln and Washington have had their birthdays. In fact, it might as well be spring. Which is about the time the squire of Wistful Vista starts writing his Christmas thank you notes, urged on by his conscience, otherwise known as Mrs. McGee. And here about to start the job, we find Fibber McGee and Molly. <laughs> Now, the first note you ought to write, dearie, is... I one... haven't got to that yet. I've got to write a check first. Whom to? The Elks Club. Five bucks. Heavenly days. Have you ripped the billiard table cloth again? Nope. The caretaker's got to have appendicitis operation and can't afford it, so all the members are chipping in five bucks apiece. Oh, yeah. well, that's very nice, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, say, is the caretaker that big fat man named Joe? <laughs> yeah, that's the fellow, Charlie. <clears throat> Doc Gamble's going to do the operation. <laughs> I never knew Dr. Gamble to wait till somebody had enough money before he'd operate. Oh, Doc, don't care. But the boys at the club say they hate to see a pot open without a few chips on the table. <laughs> now, let me see. Where's my... Uh-oh. What's oh. the matter? Can't find my fountain pen. You see my fountain pen? The one with a solid gold point onto it? No, I haven't, Pat. You had it yesterday, though. My gosh, I'd hate to lose that fountain pen. Fred Nittany gave me that pen. Who? Fred Nittany. You've heard me speak of Fred Nittany from Star Rock, Illinois. He's the guy that I and he used to have a vaudeville act together in vaudeville. Oh, sure. That mm -hmm. Fred Nittany. Mm -hmm. Did he give you the pen for Christmas? No, he gave me that pen in 1922. We signed our first contract with that pen. Oh, with the Orpheum Circuit? No, no, just with each other. I, <laughs> I promised I wouldn't sneeze while he was juggling, and he promised not to mug while I was singing Give the Baby a Lacing, Mother. He just threw another shoe. <laughs> that was one of my... Oh, hello, old-timer. Everything's fine, thank you. Yeah, except I seem to have lost a very valuable fountain pen. Lost a what, Johnny? I lost a very... Fountain pen, eh? That's too bad. I'd let you take mine, but I haven't got one. <laughs> well, this pen of mine has got a lot of sentimental value to me, old-timer. My old vaudeville partner gave me it. Your old what, Johnny? My old Gee vaude... willikers, were you in vaudeville, Johnny? <laughs> so was I. Well, were you really, old-timer? What kind of an act did you have? Magic, daughter. Used to saw a lady in half. But I couldn't stand it very long. Why not? Hey! I says, why couldn't Well, you? sir, every time I'd see my assistant off stage, he'd kind of laugh and say, Who was that lady I sawed with you last night? <laughs> I got so sick of that joke, I give up the act and joined the CBs. <laughs> that was right after Pearl Harper. You mean Pearl Harbor? No, Pearl Harper, daughter. She was the girl I sawed in half. <laughs> she took on so much weight, it stretched my act ten minutes, sawing her in two. <laughs> I had a song and dance act myself, old-timer. Yeah. The only way I can get my husband to dance even now is to pay him for it. 
<laughs> That's pretty good, daughter. But that ain't the way I heard it. The way I heard it, one feller says to his doctor, Say, he says, every time I eat strawberries, my skin breaks out. Can you cure me? I don't know, says the doctor. I hate to make any rash promises. <laughs> mm. Well, I hope you find your pants, darling. <laughs> McGee, where'd you use your fountain pen last? I know I had it yesterday when I was making out my income tax. Hey, what was I wearing yesterday? Let me see. Your blue serge suit. I was? Yeah. Oh, well, my gosh, all I got to do is run upstairs and look in the best pocket. I no, always... no, McGee. Huh? Your blue serge suit went to the cleaner this morning. What? With my fountain pen in it? Yeah. Didn't you go through the pockets before you sent it? Well, Natch, I always do. <laughs> but I didn't see anything in your fountain pen. May have slipped down through the lining, though. Doggone those cleaners anyway. Deliberately walking out of here with my blue serge suit with my fountain pen in it. That's practically burglary. That's what it is. That's stealing. Oh, for goodness they... sakes. Now, if they find it, they'll return it. They're very reliable people. Well, they better find it. That's all I got to say. Walking into people's houses like that and practically stealing people's valuable gold-pointed fountain pens that Fred Mitney give them. <laughs> if that's the way people are running their business nowadays, I'm glad I'm not living a hundred years from now if it gets any worse. <laughs> now, nonsense, dear. You're making a big fuss about nothing. Uh... You fly off the handle like a 30-cent hammer. I'm going to fly down to that cleaning place and make them return my fountain pen Get your hat and coat, baby I'll just do that little thing, McGee yeah. Even if you don't find your fountain pen, the fresh air will cool you off a little Yeah Now you lock up the house whilst I get my... Okay, you betcha, make it snappy I'll love them. <laughs> Ah, there goes a good kid How she ever puts up with these nasty moods of mine, I'll never know Except that she knows they never last more than a half hour <laughs> Once a week Usually Tuesdays. But even so, I... Come in. Hi, mister. Oh, hello there, Teeny. <laughs> State your business briefly now, sis, because I'm very busy right now. I've got to get downtown. Oh. Well, gee, mister, I didn't come over here because I wanted to. I came because you told me to. What? You told me to come over yesterday, remember? No, I don't. Well, you did, I bet you. What were the circumstances? Well, the circumstances were I saw you in the drugstore, mm -hmm. and Mr. Toops was weighing himself, and you got on the scale with him and divided the weight by two so you wouldn't have to pay another penny. Mm -hmm. And I said you were cheating the drugstore man. You said, don't be nosy, and if I came over today, you'd tell me a story. Those were the circumstances. Well, I, I'm sorry, sis. I haven't got time today. Maybe some other time. Okay. I... Okay, I'll tell. I'll tell everybody. Uh, I'll tell the drugstore men and the newspapers okay, and I'll okay, tell... Okay, 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 okay. Cut it out. <laughs> I'll tell you a story. Hmm. Thanks, mister. You're awful nice to little children. <laughs> okay. I ever tell you about Myrtle the turtle? Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, sir, once upon a time there lived a turtle named Myrtle. Mm-hmm. She laid dozens and dozens of eggs, and they all hatched out into little baby turtles, so everybody called her Myrtle the Fertile Turtle. Uh. One day there was a big earthquake, which threw Myrtle over on her back. And when a turtle gets through on its back, it's just simply helpless. Um. Yes, sir. Well, sir, the baby turtles were too dumb to know what to do. They thought Mama was just taking some exercises, so they hung around and watched while she kicked her legs this way and that, jerking and twitching. And uh... She made so much commotion that some turtle hunters saw her and grabbed her and all the young turtles and sold them all to a restaurant, and they all wound up as turtle soup. And you know what that all goes to prove, sis? Sure I do, I bet you. What? Just because you're upset about something, you don't have to get everybody else in a stew. <laughs> Billy Mills and the orchestra and three little words.
house all locked up. Let's get down to that dry cleaners. I'm going to read them fountain pen stealers the riot act. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if they'd planned this whole thing. Just waiting for a chance to get my gold-pointed fountain pen. I'll bet you're right, McGee. You betcha. Yes, sir. I'll bet they invested $50,000 in that dry-cleaning plant 19 years ago with the very idea in mind of someday getting a hold of your $5 fountain pen. <laughs> well, that ain't so silly. How about the time I left my wallet and my gray pants with $17 in it? How about that? Well, how about it? They returned it the next day, didn't they? Sure they did. And why? Just to keep me from getting suspicious, that's why. Oh. <laughs> If they're out after fountain pens, they ain't going to money around with mere monkey. I mean, monkey around with mere money. Bye, George. Looks like we wouldn't be leaving for a minute, McGee. Come in. Hello, Molly. Hello there, Dr. Gamble. Come right in. Thank you. And what are you looking so sour about, persimmon puss? <laughs> You'd look sour, too, Aerosmith, if somebody had deliberately stole your solid gold-pointed fountain pen that had been given to you by Fred Nittany from Star Rock. Not really stolen, Doctor. He left it in a suit that went to the cleaner, he thinks. Better be careful of those accusations, chowderhead. Or one of these days, you're going to be the surprised possessor of a slander suit with two pairs of pants. Incidentally, who's Fred Nittany, if anybody? Why, Fred Nittany's his old vaudeville partner, Doctor. He gave McGee the fountain pen years ago. Vaudeville? Were you in vaudeville, McGee? I used to go to the theater every week when I was a young man going to medical school. I don't remember seeing you. So what? I don't remember seeing you either. <laughs> Well, the 15-cent seats were usually so far back. Uh, oh, I almost forgot, McGee. Forgot what, Captain so Happy? <laughs> Are you coming to the board meeting at the Elks tonight? Only 10 or 12 left. I can't make it, Doc. I'm sorry. You take six for me, will you? I'll pay you later. Okay. Good night, Molly. Night. Good night. Take six of what for you, McGee? What kind of a board meeting is it? Punch board. Hey, we got to get down to the dry cleaners, Molly. Every minute we waste is more time for them burglars to hide the evidence. Come on, let's go. Bye, George. Now, just a minute, McGee. Are you sure you left it in that suit? Have you looked around the house thoroughly? No, and I don't have to. I always carry that pen in that blue serge suit. On account of it leaks a little, and the blue serge suit don't show it. And furthermore... Hello, folks. I just thought I'd drop... Oh, you're going out? Down to the dry cleaners, Mr. Wilcox. They have a suit of McGee's in which he thinks he left a valuable to nobody but him fountain pen. The intrinsic value is of no import. It's the sentimental value, Junior. My old vaudeville partner, Fred Nittany, from Star Rock, Illinois, gave me that pen. He thinks more of his pen than the government does of Alcatraz, Mr. Wilson. Well, <laughs> you know how sentimental all these old vaudevillians are, Molly. I was an actor once, and I know. What do you mean, once? You're so hammy right now, you use mustard-flavored shaving cream. Oh. <laughs> Well, he's right, Molly. I still have a kind of a yen to go back on the stage. You know, I always wanted to do Romeo. Do Juliet a favor, Buster, and lay off. <laughs> You're getting a little broad across the pistol pockets for tights. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that, McGee. I think Mr. Wilcox would be a very handsome Romeo. <laughs> do you know the part, Mr. Wilcox? Oh, sure. As a matter of fact, I just wrote it out for a little entertainment they're putting on tomorrow night for the Johnson Wax Salesman. Uh, here, see? Oh. Look, Junie. Anytime you write Shakespeare for them guys, the stage is going to be hip deep in Johnson's wax. Enter Lady Macbeth, lower left, with a roll top desk. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Oh, but McGee, this looks awfully good. Read it, Mr. Wilcox. Okay, I'll be Romeo. You read Juliet's part. Oh, my gosh. This is going to set Orson Welles back 20 years. <laughs> you be quiet now, McGee. Go ahead, Mr. Wilcox. Act two, scene two Capulet's Garden. Enter Romeo. On a high wheel bicycle. Hush, dearie. Enter Romeo. He jests at scars that never felt a wound. Juliet appears above at window. With shotgun. <laughs> but soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Ah, me. She speaks. <laughs> what dost thou, fair Juliet? I dust John living room, my Romeo. <laughs> My father, the Capulet, would have a prideful home, so Johnson's wax protects his, his worldly goods. And I, no slave to household task, make light of labor thus so neatly foiled. Ain't this awful, folks? <laughs> ah, sweet Juliet, a goodly spouse you'll make to know that dust and dirt cling not to wax-protected things. That's Capulet. <laughs> would that our love could be as well preserved. It can, my Romeo, and gleam as brightly as a Johnson-polished home. This very balcony from which I speak, its wood is shielded from the elements by wax. It... 
Where's the rest of this, Romeo? Or Mr. Wilcox? Well, that's all I had time to do. I'm going to finish it this evening. How do you like it? If you're asking me, Waxy, I'll settle for Olsen and Johnson. <laughs> Your Shakespeare's as phony as a six-bit henna rinse. <laughs> I thought it was wonderful, Mr. Wilcox. Have you got to go now? Yeah. Uh, I'll see you later, folks. Whence goest thou, Romeo? Homeo. Oh. <laughs> My goodness, isn't he talented, McGee? I think he has a great flair for the theater. Yeah. If he had any bigger flair, our fire insurance wouldn't be worth a nickel. <laughs> hey, what time is it? It's almost half past. Oh, my gosh, we got to get going, Molly. Them dry cleaners might be closed up and skipping town by this time. Doggone it, we never will get out of here at this rate. I think there's a power watching over you, dearie, mm -hmm. trying to keep you from making a dunce of yourself. Come in. Oh, good afternoon, Mrs. Carstairs. Do come in. How do you do, my dear? I see you have your coat on. Am I detaining you? We're just going down to the dry cleaners, Carsty. They stole my fountain pen. Oh, now, wait a minute, McGee. That's a serious charge to make, you know. If it was the wistful vista dry cleaners, Mr. McGee, I must say I have always found them extremely meticulous. Aha, uh -huh. you hear that, Molly? Even Carsty says they're meticulous. I knew it. I had a feeling... Meticulous, the... dearie, meticulous means careful. Huh? Oh, it does? Yeah. <laughs> Is that what you meant, Carsty? Yes, Mr. McGee. Oh. Mr. Carstairs has left jewelry in his pockets many, many times, mm -hmm. and the cleaners have always returned it immediately. Uh, <laughs> he's so absent-minded, you know. Is he really, Millicent? Oh, yes, indeed, my dear. Why, just last night as we were coming home in a taxi cab from a rather gay party, he leaned over to me and said, Remember now, not a word of this to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> What did you say, Karsty? Oh, I said, of course not, dear. But you better get out a block or two from the house. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> oh, it must be a little disturbing to be married to a man like him, Millicent. Oh, he's quite harmless, Mrs. McGee. One can't dislike a beagle merely because he thinks he's a wolf. <laughs> oh, which reminds me, my dear. Will you go to the dog show with me Friday afternoon? Sure she will, Karsty, and so will I. You... Uh, how nice. <laughs> I just love dog shows, Millicent. Is your dog in the show? Uh, yes, she is, and I hope she goes through with it this year. Why? What happened last year, Karsty? At the last minute, she scratched herself. Oh, God. <laughs> well, <laughs> I do hope you find your pen, Mr. McGee. Good day. <laughs> And here are the King's Men with onesie twosie. You'd never think arithmetic was something you'd enjoy. But when it's done a certain way, it's fun for every girl and boy. Onesie, twosie, I love you. Zee, twosie, threesie, you kiss me. Zee, threesie, foursie, kiss some more. Zee, let's go counting higher. Fourzy, fivesy, man alive. Zee, fivesy, sixy, hug me quick. Zee, sixy, sevensy, this is heavensy. My heart's on a flyer. Keep the numbers going till the song is done. Love will keep on growing and we'll have lots of fun. Sevensy, eightsy, you're my datesy. Eightsy, ninesy, ain't this finesy. Ninesy, tensy, start again. Zee, onesy, twosy, I love you, Z. Oh, you gotta count onesy, twosy, cause I'm choosy. I'll kiss you. It's so easy, you kiss me, see. Threezy, fourzy, I adore, see. Kiss some more, see. Why don't we count a little higher? Fourzy, fivesy, kind of jivesy, ain't it like, see. Fivesy, sixy, nothing tricksy, hug me quick, see. Sixy, sevensy, how it sends me this is heaven, see. My heart is slowly catching fire. Keep the numbers going till the song is done. Love will keep on growing and we'll have lots of fun. Seventy, eighty, you're my daisy. This is crazy. Eighty, ninety, so refined. You are mine. Ninety, tensy, ain't no endsy. Start again, see what a frenzy. And all because I. McGee? Next block, Oak Street, near 14th. And you see those green lamps in the middle of the block there? Yes, what's that? Police station. 
If these fountain pen thieves don't pony over my gold-pointed fountain pen immediately or sooner, I'm going to swear out a warrant to the Hold it, hold it, McGee. Here comes Mr. Wimple. Huh? Who? Oh, oh, hi, Wimp, old man. Hello, folks. Out for a little walk, Mr. Wimple? Yes, I'm just seeking inspiration, Mrs. McGee. I find that walking helps me think. Inspiration for what, Wimp? Poetry, Mr. McGee. Oh. I have an order for some greeting cards, and I have to write them tonight. I think I have a good one for Mother's Day. Oh, I'd love to hear it, Mr. Wimple. How does it go? <clears throat> it goes, Mama, dear Mama, this is your day. So drop your work, come out and play. Hear the children sing good wishes. Then go back and do the dishes. <laughs> That's more truth than poetry, Wimp. <laughs> Not that it's much of either one. <laughs> Have you any others, Mr. Wimple? Well, I was working on one for a friend that's sick in the hospital. Sort of a sympathy card. Oh, I bet this one will have him in stitches. <laughs> Read it, Wimp. It goes <clears throat> to a friend who is sick. I'm sorry you are sick, my friend. I'm sorry you are ill. In a place where they wake you up at four to give you a sleeping pill. I hope you have a lovely nurse to help when fever starts to boil you. And if you have, move over, kid, because I'll be right down there to join you. <laughs> well, I'll see you later, folks. Well, here's the dry cleaning place, Molly. Now, you let me do the talking. Oh, I know better than to try and stop you, dearie. But now be reasonable. What do you mean, be reasonable? With guys that deliberately stole my fountain pen? Come on. Yes, sir? What can I do for you, sir? You picked up a blue serge suit at my house this morning, bud. Yes? And my husband thinks he left his fountain pen in it. I know darn well I left my fountain pen in it. I always have my pen in that blue serge suit. Now, look, Buster, I want that fountain pen back, or bye, George... Oh, now, just a moment, sir. Give us a chance to investigate. I can tell you immediately if your pen has been found. What was the name, please? Parker. Your address, Mrs. Parker? <laughs> the name is McGee, bud. Oh, well, uh, which of you is making the complaint, Mr. McGee or Mrs. Parker? I, I am Mrs. McGee. The pen's name was Parker. <laughs> it was a solid, gold-pointed, kind of greenish pen that was given to me by a Fred Nittany from Star Rock, Illinois. Old partner of mine in vaudeville. Hmm, actors. Do you have an address? 79 Whistle Vista. Oh, yes, I remember. You've been our customers for many years. Of course, that would be, uh, Driver Kryle being Route 3. Oh, Miss Fregelhorn. Yes, Mr. Houghton Trout. Was there a fountain pen in a suit from 79 Wistful Vista, Route 3? No, Mr. Houghton Trout. Two papers of matches, some pool chalk, a nail file, a rabbit's foot, and a ticket stub for the World Series of 1932. <laughs> They're in the mail. Well, thank you, Miss Fregelhorn. No, I'm sorry, Mr. McGee, but... But you ain't half as sorry as you're going to be. Why, George, when a man trusts a business institution like this, to be honest, and then has him walk out with a solid gold-pointed fountain pen that was given to him by Fred Nittany... Now, wait a minute, McGee. I'm sure, Mr. McGee. You're sure? You ain't as sure as I am, Buster. I'll bet you got that whole back room there stacked to the ceiling with stolen fountain pens. <laughs> Deliberately walking into people's homes and taking suits full of fountain pens. That's larceny, bud. And by Georgia... I... May I ask one question, Mr. McGee? Certainly. Certainly, Mr. Houghton Trout. And make it snappy, bud. One question. What is it? How would you like a good poke in the nose? Oh. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Not only a burglar, but a tough guy, eh? Come out from behind that counter, Buster, and I'll fix you up a knuckle sandwich. Nobody can talk oh, to now, me now, like that. Oh, now, 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 now. Stop it, both of you. <laughs> Mr. Houghton Trout. What is the procedure when somebody thinks you have something and you think you have it? The proper procedure is to make out a claim blank. Well, give us one, please. Certainly. Here you are. I don't want to make out a claim. I want to bust this fresh guy right in the beezer. Fill it out, dearie. <laughs> well, okay. Where's the pencil? Uh, they have to be filled out in ink, Mr. McGee. Here, use my pen. I don't want any favors from you, Cy. I'll use my own pen. Now then. Name and address. Describe the lost article. Approximate value. McGee. Huh? Where'd you get that pen you're using? This pen? Well, this was given to me by Fred Nittany from Star Rock. <laughs> <laughs> well, imagine that, writing this code all the time. Go on, apologize to Mr. Houghton Trout, dearie. Sure. I'm sorry, Houghton Trout, old man. Quite all right, Mr. McGee. 
Shall I tear up the claim blank? Oh, no, I might as well finish it out. Bound to lose this pen sometime. <laughs> now then, state the circumstances under which the article... Oh, this is ridiculous. <laughs> The next time you tune in Fibber, McGee, and Molly, the not-so-merry month of March will be here. How is March around your particular part of the world? Quite probably a little on the wet side. And you know what that means. More mud and dirt tracked into your nice, clean kitchen and hallways. Well, this March, why don't you save yourself a lot of work and worry by using glow coat on your linoleum? No matter how much mud is tracked in, you can have a sparkling, clean floor in a jiffy with Johnson's glow coat. Just wipe up with a damp cloth, and it shines like new again. It's no trouble at all to glow coat linoleum, of course. Just spread it around on the floor and let it dry. Glow coat shines itself, does all the work. In 20 minutes, your floors are wax polished and beautifully shining, never streaked or uneven. You'll be glad to know that the tough film of glow coat protects your linoleum, too, against dirt, wear, and spill things. That means its bright colors and attractive patterns will stay new looking far longer. Why not have your linoleum ready for bad weather by using Johnson's self polishing glow coat? Calm down, McGee. Yeah. Just sitting here exercising my rights as an American citizen. With my old mandolin. I'm a one-man music union. Meaning what? I mean, nobody can interfere with my lawful right to peacefully pick it. <laughs> oh, dear. Good night. Good night, all. This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson's Wax Products for Home and Industry, inviting you to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company.